Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at a video from a channel called Got Questions Ministries, which asks the question, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Of course, we all know what the Bible says about it. It says don't. But some churches actually manage to interpret it in a way as to be more accepting, so maybe this will be one of those. Nah, you guys know it's not. It wouldn't be featured here if it were. So let's get to that. But first, a word from our sponsor. Okay, let's see. I'll make all the animals in pairs, because they need to reproduce, but humans only get one. God, God, we've got a problem. <sighs> what is it, Gabriel? Well, it turns out you weren't using Surfshark when you set up your human and tree of knowledge configuration files over the network. So Satan was able to access all of that unencrypted data. He's probably up to something. What's Surfshark? Surfshark is a VPN, a virtual private network, which is a service that encrypts all of your data so that nobody, not even your internet service provider or the Prince of Darkness, can see what you've been doing. It can keep your personal data protected from cyber criminals like Satan. I see. Is that something I'd have to set up on my laptop here, or could I use it on my tablet instead? It works on both. They've got apps available for Windows, Mac, Linux, and mobile devices, which include some great features like an ad blocker, a kill switch, and a whitelist that can allow specific apps or websites to bypass the VPN. Setup is a breeze. If you don't want the hassle of figuring out all the specifics yourself, you can connect with a single click to the fastest available server. But you still have access to all of the more advanced options that some power users prefer. It allows you to connect an unlimited number of devices simultaneously, it allows you to set up a static IP address if you need it, and you can even get the more advanced security of a multi-hop connection, kind of like a VPN within a VPN. I don't know. I've got an awful lot of devices connected to my network. After all, I'm God. I have all the devices. Wouldn't that take me a long time to set up? Not at all. Not only is it super easy to set up the app on pretty much any device, it's as easy as logging in then clicking connect, but if you have an OpenVPN compatible router, there are step-by-step -step instructions that walk you through the process of connecting to the VPN directly from your router, protecting your entire network all at once. These security features sound good, but is that really all that it does? What do you mean, is that all it does? That's an amazing service, but it's not all that it does. Because it protects your data, that includes your location data, so if you connect to a different country's server, you can unlock media content that is location restricted. They even provide a smart DNS service, which is kind of like an unencrypted VPN that will work on devices like smart TVs and gaming consoles which don't have VPN apps. It's not as secure as a VPN, but it'll do for unlocking geo-restricted content in a pinch. But I'm God. I can just be from any country. True, but this is a bit more convenient than having to use miracle powers every time you want to watch a different country's Netflix, isn't it? I suppose you're right, but isn't a service like this prohibitively expensive? But you're got... you know what, never mind. No, right now it's cheaper than ever. If you go to the URL in the video description and use coupon code RHINO at checkout, you can save 83% on their 24-month plan, plus you get three free bonus months, bringing the price down to just $2.21 a month, all with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so it's completely risk-free. Wow, just two twenty one a month? That's not bad at all. Okay, I'm sold. From now on, I'll always use Surfshark when designing things over the network. And you're going to go back and fix the ones you've already done, right? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll get right on that. Okay, it looks like Eve.exe has a vulnerability that can be exploited by editing the subroutine in the Tree of Knowledge Matrix. So all I have to do is compile the fruit configuration. Today's question is, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Is homosexuality a sin? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective. Well, to answer that from a non-biblical perspective, no, it's not a sin. Because in order for it to be a sin, a god to sin against must first exist. And any god powerful enough to have created the entire universe couldn't possibly be petty enough to worry about what some of the denizens of that universe do with their genitalia. 
Like, seriously, I've often compared this to a human being being concerned about the sexual practices of an individual ant, but we don't even have to get that far distant. Some 90% of giraffe sex is homosexual sex, but you don't see evangelicals picketing the giraffe exhibits at the zoo. You sold me queer giraffes. I want my money back. Okay, that 90% number is not necessarily accurate. It comes from a study where researchers observed 16 homosexual mountings and one heterosexual mounting over the course of three years, and this is too small a sample to allow us to draw any... Uh, firm conclusions. But one thing is certain. Giraffes have a lot of gay sex. Back to my point... Any god who is enough of a god to have created the universe would be above such petty things as what the humans do with their genitals. So if a god exists for which homosexuality is a sin, then that god is a petty god. In some people's minds, being homosexual is as much outside one's control as the color of your skin or your height. Right. Human sexuality is a complicated beast, and determining the cause of one behavior or another is a tricky business, to say the least. But one thing is certain, the factors that lead to non-heterosexual behavior in humans are outside of the control of the individual that exhibits such behavior. Now, let me be absolutely clear right off the bat here. You could demonstrate conclusively to me that non-heterosexual behaviors are completely a matter of individual choice, and my position would remain the same. They have every right to engage in such behavior as long as everyone involved is a consenting adult. But the fact of the matter is that there are a myriad of factors that go into the outcome, genes, the endocrine system of the womb that they're carried in, hormonal factors, and more. On the other hand, the Bible clearly and consistently declares that homosexual activity is a sin. This disconnect leads to much controversy, debate, and even hostility. Yeah. GSRM people, that is gender, sexual, and romantic minorities, a blanket term that covers everybody in a shorter initialism than LGBTQ+, but GRSM people don't appreciate being told that just being who they are is sinful and gross and worth the death penalty. There is no good reason for opposing GSRM rights. It's just these passages in some book that says slavery is also okay that says that they're wrong. And that book is always right, so we have to abide by it, even in the face of evidence mounting that not only is it not a choice, but that allowing things like same-sex marriage has a significant positive impact on public health. So I'm tempted to add this to the list of things that the Bible is wrong about scientifically, but the Bible never actually gives any reason for why it forbids homosexuality. It just forbids it without justification. It's wrong because God said so, and we can't question God. Curiously, in the Old Testament, which was written in a time when men having multiple wives was a fairly common occurrence, it specifically forbids male homosexuality, but says nothing of female homosexuality. It's not until the New Testament, written in a time when polygamy had fallen out of favor culturally, that we see any proclamation against women engaging in homosexual behavior. I wonder why that could be. When examining what the Bible says about homosexuality, it is important to distinguish between homosexual behavior and homosexual inclinations or attractions. It is the difference between act of sin and the passive condition of being tempted. In other words, you can be GSRM, just make sure you act straight. Nice. Now, how about we try a thought experiment for a moment? You are allowed to have straight inclinations, but you're not allowed to act on them. You either have to be celibate for the rest of your life, or enter into a gay relationship. Would you be able to do that? And then add in people telling you that it's a heinous crime against God every time you look at a woman and are even mildly attracted to her. If you're already married, you have to get a divorce in order to live in accordance with God's will. Now, tell me, would you be capable of doing any of that? What would you think of a god who insisted on this from you, and of the people who insisted on enforcing God's will in this matter through social pressures, all while attempting to outlaw the relationship that you already have with your wife? Because that's exactly what you are doing here. Homosexual behavior is sinful, but the Bible never says it is a sin to be tempted. Did Jesus not say, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart? What is that saying if not that being tempted with sexual attraction is itself sinful? 
And since you seem to be admitting here that sexuality is not a choice, then that means that sexuality is determined by factors that God is in control of, which means that he made some people in a way that will ensure that they are guaranteed to be sinful for their entire life. You know what? I heard it. That's kind of God's M.O., isn't it? Make it broken and then blame it for being broken. So carry on then, I guess. Simply stated, a struggle with temptation may lead to sin, but the struggle itself is not a sin. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 teaches that homosexuality is a result of denying and disobeying God. When people continue in sin and unbelief, God gives them over to even more wicked and deprived sin to show them the futility and hopelessness of a life apart from God. Yes, so even according to the Bible, God makes people GSRM. God forces them to be something that he knows he is not going to be happy with. It gets the timing wrong. Most GSRM people recognize that they are GSRM in early childhood, often before the onset of puberty. So the idea that there's just a bunch of evil toddlers running around, you know what? I heard it. Toddlers are often quite evil. My point still stands, though. According to the Bible verse that you're about to pull up, Romans 1, 26-27, God gave them up to these dishonorable passions, having relations that are contrary to nature. Well, I guess just go ahead and add that to the list of scientific inaccuracies in the Bible. We've already discussed giraffes, but homosexual activity can be found in pretty much any mammal species that you care to look for it in. And the farther away from mammals you get, the freakier the sex gets. Everything from necrophiliac penguins to mushrooms with tens of thousands of biological sexes. Here's a neat cardinal who is essentially exactly half male and half female. It's got one functioning testis and one functioning ovary, and it could potentially successfully mate with either sex. Bilateral gynatomorphism, which is what this is called, has been observed in a number of species, mostly butterflies. And I ask you, is it even possible for such an organism to have straight sex? There's even a species of lizard who has evolved past the need for males, and so they're all a bunch of lesbian lizards, and the lesbian sex is what stimulates egg production, so they still have sex, and that sex results in babies, but all the sex is lesbian sex. But no, according to the Bible, only straight sex is natural. Now I'm gonna skip past the Bible verse, I really don't think we need to hear it at this point. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 proclaims that those who practice homosexuality and therefore transgress God's created order are not saved. Right. Nice. Okay, so remember our thought experiment from earlier? Let's continue that for a little bit. If you don't divorce your wife and you die while still married to her, you will automatically go to hell no matter what else you believe. That's what you're telling people here. You're dehumanizing GSRM people and treating their relationships as though they aren't on the same emotional level as a straight relationship, and then you tell them that they deserve to be tortured forever for wanting to enjoy the same intimacy that you're allowed to enjoy, just because they're attracted to the wrong people. Your complete lack of empathy is, quite frankly, disgusting. For anyone who actually takes you seriously, this basically amounts to psychological torture. A person may be born with a greater susceptibility to homosexuality, just as some people are born with a tendency to violence and other sins. That does not excuse the person's choosing to sin by giving in to sinful desires. No, absolutely not. Who you are attracted to and what kind of person you are looking for in a partner is in no way the equivalent of having violent tendencies. For starters, the most obvious difference is that violent tendencies have a significant negative impact on other people. Being GSRM does not. Legalizing violent crime would not make society better. Though I guess you could technically say that the crime rate dropped overnight. Legalizing same-sex marriage, though, objectively makes society better through better public health outcomes. But won't someone think of the children? What about the children that the gays will want to start adopting? The research thus far indicates that they do no better or worse than the children of heterosexual couples. So you're conflating a behavior that hurts no one, the tolerance of which is demonstrably good for society, with a behavior that is inherently harmful, the tolerance of which is demonstrably bad for society. Sorry, but that's just not an accurate picture. Just because a person is born with a greater susceptibility to fits of rage, that doesn't make it right for him to give in to those desires at every provocation. 
No, but if we insist on carrying on with this absolute steaming pile of garbage of an analogy, the uncontrolled fits of rage would be more akin to rape, but becoming an MMA fighter and channeling those violent tendencies into excelling at a sport being akin to a consensual relationship. People with violent tendencies have healthy outlets for those tendencies. What you are saying here is that someone who has a natural talent for MMA needs to stop focusing on MMA because you don't like it, and your holy book says that MMA is bad, so they need to play baseball instead. Even if they become proficient at baseball, do you think they'll still have the same life satisfaction as they could have had if they instead focused on the sport that they're passionate about? Now, add on top of this the idea that if you refuse to like baseball better than you like MMA, you'll get sent to a torture chamber with no hope of escape. Your worldview sucks is what I'm getting at. The same is true with susceptibility to homosexuality. No matter our proclivities or attractions, we cannot continue to define ourselves by the very sins that crucified Jesus. Every thrust of a dick into a butt is another hammer that is striking the nail in Jesus' hands. Fuck man, this shit's dark. And at the same time, assume we are right with God. If God is that obsessed with our genitals, that's not our problem, that's his problem. He should maybe have thought twice about making us with preferences that he can't tolerate. You agreed that it was his choice to instill these preferences in us, so there's no way that God comes out of this looking like anything other than the immoral monster that the Bible portrays him as. Paul lists many of the sins that the Corinthians once practiced. Homosexuality is on the list. And someone claiming to be Paul said that all the people from the island of Crete are lying, evil, lazy, gluttonous beasts. Forgive me for not just taking the Bible at face value when it describes how sinful other cultures of the time were. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, he reminds them, That is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You keep saying stuff like that, but you have yet to provide anything to suggest that being GSRM is even wrong to begin with. What does it say about your worldview if you can't even look at the data to see whether or not you're right, you just have to trust that you're right in spite of all of the evidence to the contrary? Well, I suppose it's possible that you are right, that these things that are demonstrably good for society are considered evil by God simply because God said so. But divine command is not a great place to get your morality, as it can essentially be used to justify any immoral action, and has been time and time again. As long as you sincerely believe that God placed it on your heart to do that action, it was a good thing to do. In other words, some of the Corinthians before they were saved lived homosexual lifestyles, but no sin is too great for the cleansing power of Jesus. And given that conversion therapy, a frequently Christian endeavor, is such a spectacular failure, we can go ahead and dismiss the claim that Jesus can cure the gay. The International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims, together with the Independent Forensic Expert Group, has put out an official statement declaring conversion therapy to be a form of torture, noting that this therapy practice has zero science backing it up, it is not effective in achieving its goals, and it has a wide array of negative health outcomes, everything from PTSD to depressive syndromes to social isolation, sexual dysfunction, and suicide. Using Jesus to cure homosexuality is a demonstrably harmful practice that has never been found to be reliably effective, and even if it were effective, the negative side effects that it has far outweigh any of the benefits, because there's basically no benefit to changing your sexual orientation. The only benefits that being straight has over being GSRM would disappear if people would stop being bigoted and hateful toward GSRM people. So I guess you're just following God's example, create a problem, and then get mad at those for whom it is a problem and demand that they fix it or suffer the consequences. Once cleansed, we are no longer defined by our sin. Yeah, it's just a simple matter of upending your entire life and not being allowed to live with someone that you love. Permanent separation from loved ones is a good thing, right? The problem with homosexual attraction is that it's an attraction to something God has forbidden. Did it ever occur to you that maybe God was just a jerk for forbidding something that doesn't do any harm, knowing full well that the act of forbidding it will cause a hell of a lot of harm? 
Also, this has been bothering me for the whole video, but apparently this video is in a series called Bible Munch. And I don't know, maybe it's because of the terms butt munch and carpet munch, but I associate the word munch with sexual acts, so this makes it sound like you're performing sexual acts on your Bible. Well, you'll get no judgment from me for that, but I feel like God might have a thing or two to say about it. And any desire for something sinful ultimately has its roots in sin. The pervasive nature of sin causes us to see the world and our own actions through a warped perspective. Well, I mean, if the warped perspective is the one that lets people be happy when they aren't hurting anyone, then sure, I'll take the warped perspective. Like I said, you still haven't actually explained what is even wrong with homosexuality other than to say that God doesn't like it. That's not good enough for me to start speaking out against homosexuality, and it certainly isn't good enough to force the hundreds of thousands of gay married couples to upend their entire lives, not to mention all the unmarried GSRM people who have entire lives and communities built up around acceptance. You're asking people to do horrible, horrible things to other people that are demonstrably harmful without providing any reason other than the Bible says it's icky. Our thoughts, desires, and dispositions are all affected. So homosexual attraction does not always result in active, willful sin. There may not be a conscious choice to sin, but it springs from the sinful nature. Yeah, see? It's your horrible, dirty, sinful nature that's the problem. You just have to repress who you are as a person, and then God might love you. This is disgusting, man. Come on. Same-sex attraction is always, on some basic level, an expression of the fallen nature. You are created broken, and then blamed for your brokenness by the guy who made you that way. Those who struggle with homosexual attraction often report suffering through years of wishing things were different. Yes, exactly! And do you know why that is? It's because they're growing up around asshats like you who are vehemently opposed to this perfectly normal behavior, and they don't want people like you, who permeate their entire community, to think that they are immoral monsters that you think the GSRM people are. So they struggle against it, thinking that there's something wrong with them, when the fact of the matter is that you are the problem. People may not always be able to control how or what they feel, but they can control what they do with those feelings. So even though you feel that being gay is icky, you can control yourself and just choose not to act like a bigot who would rather see GSRM people go through the literal torture that is conversion therapy than allow them to live happy, healthy, productive lives. Finally, the Bible does not describe homosexuality as a greater sin than any other. All sin is offensive to God. Without Christ, we are lost, whatever type of sin has entangled us. Don't worry, if you're gay, you're not worse than a serial killer. You're equally bad. I'm sorry, but if your moral code suggests that consensual gay sex is the same level of badness as murder, then your moral code is shit. According to the Bible, God's forgiveness is available to the homosexual, just as it is to the adulterer, idol worshiper, murderer, and thief. Don't worry, this thing that's a part of who you are that you couldn't change even if you wanted to, that's just as bad as being an adulterer, murderer, idol worshiper, and thief. But if you allow yourself to be tortured for it, then God will forgive you for having been made that way by him. And that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Sanji Nadavas, who says, The church rapping video was actually a parody, a brilliant one, but no, it wasn't sincere. Well, I'm definitely open to the possibility that I am wrong, but I was under the impression that it was legit. If you're not aware, this is referring to my use of a clip of an old couple rapping about how Jesus is their N-word. Well, okay, maybe that was fake, but how about this one? Thanks for watching. Remember to check the link in the description for a discount on Surfshark, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the loving God who made my channel with severe built-in flaws. If you'd like to offer me your forgiveness for being what you made me, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, or listen to my podcast with my daughter, the links for those are also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!